I am uh, here on the Senate floor today to talk about uh, a sporting event, a, an event that captures the attention of, of people not only in my state of Alaska, but around the country and around the globe. I'm talking about the last great race on Earth. Pretty fancy, big, uh, impressive title for, for what really happens. The ultimate uh, challenge uh, with man, woman, and dogs. An 1,100-mile sled dog race from, from uh, Anchorage to, to Nome uh, up north. So <clears throat> share with you all a picture that was taken at 3.39 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the 13th of, of March. Obviously, the middle of the night. Um, I know everybody thinks that it's always dark in Alaska this time of year, but it's not. But this is 3.39 a.m. Wednesday, March 13th, but it's pretty pitch dark. You can't really see it in this picture, but the snow is coming down, the wind is blowing, it's pretty dang cold. Uh, temperatures are down in the teens, but you've got some wind blowing, so it, it, it gets your attention. But what you're seeing here is, is Front Street, Front Street in Nome, Alaska. And at 3.30 a.m. in the morning, the street is packed. It's lined with hundreds of people who are cheering loudly. These are people from uh, all over the country, fans and friends and family who have, they've come uh, across Alaska, they've flown into Nome. Some of them chartered an aircraft coming out of, of the YK Delta. But they flew into Nome, a community of about 4,000 people, to witness this moment, to witness the moment that Pete Kaiser, born and raised in Bethel, Alaska, came into town with eight dogs in harness, came down the street to cross the finish line and claim victory as the 2019 Iditarod champion. He was just 12 minutes ahead of the defending champion, uh, Jor Lifseth Olsen, who was originally from Norway, who is uh, who's with us in Alaska now. But this was probably one of the closest Iditarod races that we have seen in, in some time. Uh, Jesse Royer of Fairbanks, uh, a, a friend, um, a friend of my family and, and a great lady uh, came in in third place. But uh, uh, again, when you talk about the last great race of 1,100 miles across uh, extraordinary terrain, Pete Kaiser took nine days, 12 hours, and 38 minutes to complete this. Nine days. 12 hours, 38 minutes. So think about how you cover 1,100 miles on the back of a dog sled. Dogs, <clears throat> typically, when you're moving really fast, are, are, you know, you're moving along about 10 miles an hour. Uh, but you're going over some incredible terrain. And you're doing this not just between 8 and 5. You're, you are running, you're running the trail over a course of, of days and, and weeks. So you've got Pete, Pete Kaiser here. He's just crossed the finish line. He's got his, his hands thrown up in the air in celebration. He, he hugged his family, he wiped the tears from his face, and it's one of those moments that he will always, always, always remember. The feeling, uh, probably hard to fathom. But for Pete, a, a young man who grew up in western Alaska, somebody who's often referred to as an encyclopedia of racing knowledge, someone who's known in his community for his hard work and his dedica dedication, for someone who has won the Kuskokwim 300 four times in a row now. This is a, this is a race qualifier for the Iditarod. But for his, for his family and, and his extended family who supported him, who cheered him, along on the way, again, for, for so many in, in the community of Bethel who, who joined together, they chartered an aircraft to get there in time to see him finish and celebrate this achievement. This, this truly is uh, a victory 
that is an accomplishment and an extraordinarily extraordinary highlight to, to a remarkable career. So the excitement that comes when you are finishing a, a grueling race like this, when you and your team come across the line, is, is something that you really have to experience to, to, to understand. Um, there's fatigue, uh, but there's great uh, excitement with the accomplishment. And it's not just the accomplishment of the musher. Because the musher, the musher would still be sitting back in, in Willow were it not for the extraordinary animals who, who truly, truly work to, to, to they live to run, live to, live to, to do this race and, and others like it. And while nothing beats the, the finish here, uh, I don't have very many opportunities that I can actually be at the finish because you're never quite sure when it is. It's usually uh, race winners come in between eight, nine, ten days. So if you're starting on a Sunday, usually we finish and it's during the week when we're back here working. So I haven't had the opportunity to be on that end. But I have had multiple opportunities, many, many opportunities. In fact, it's an opportunity that I do not miss, and that is to be at the front end, to be at the start of the Iditarod. So just nine days prior, this is me and Pete, Pete Kaiser, at the start of the Iditarod. He's looking pretty fresh in this picture. Probably didn't look quite so fresh after uh, nine, nine days on the trail. But, but to, to be gathered in, in downtown Anchorage uh, with 52 mushers, that's how many mushers ran this year, and... Uh, uh, all of their teams, uh, with, the, with the rules changed this year, um, teams uh, were 14, 14 dogs to a team at, at the start, but you're in downtown Anchorage and you've not only got your, your, your teams that are going to be moving you uh, through the, the first day of this ceremonial start, but you've got your other dogs. So you've got dogs, you've got mushers, you've got people, you've got kids. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a carnival atmosphere. I had an opportunity this year to, to do something I've never done before, and that was to, uh, to, to ride on the back, actually to drive the tag sled of, of one of our four-time uh, champions, Jeff King. Uh, during the ceremonial start, you go from Anchorage to Campbell Creek Airstrip. It's an 11-mile portion of the trail. So I can say that I did 1% of, of the Iditarod by, by driving on the back of this tag sled, which meant that I didn't have the dogs directly in front of me, uh, but I still had to operate the brake on this dead sled, still had to lean into the curves, still had the, the opportunity to experience uh, just the, the majesty of, of the dogs in front of you and, and the way the mushers communicate with, with, their, with their team. The, the Iditarod is, is a race like, like none other, and it is perhaps made so because of, of the challenge of the terrain that this race goes through. The journey that led the mushers through these valleys and across these mountain ranges um, is, is hard, it's challenging. And and the weather is not unlike the terrain. It was up and it was down. We had areas along the trail that were, that were rain. And then we had areas where you had freezing temperatures, you had wind, you had snow, you had ice. And so when you think about how much work it is to get through the burled arch, it is really a, a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, to be able to say that you have completed this race. As we speak, um, there are still uh, dozens more mushers and their teams that are out along that trail working to, to complete it. Now, you might think that this is something where there is a significant purse and, and that's what uh, motivates people. Well, if you, if you are successful and you finish the Iditarod, you will be able to claim $1,049. Your dogs are going to eat up that money pretty quick. Um, so 
most of this is, is so much for, for the love of, of mushing, the love of, of the animals. People always ask, well, how hard is it? What kind of challenges do the mushers encounter along the way? And it's everything from encounters with, with animals, whether they are, whether it's a, it's a moose along the trail, and we've, we've seen some, some bad outcomes from that, uh, to just physical obstructions along the trail. Richie Deal of, of Antioch ran smack into a tree, literally smack into a tree, hit his face uh, on the trail near Nikolai, he, he says he was kind of cruising along, he has his head turned, it's still dark, he looks forward and bam, he runs into a tree. He probably could have ducked if he'd noticed it, but he didn't. And so then he's kind of knocked off, he does an all-out sprint, chases his team down, dives to catch his sled. He lines up the dog team again, gets everybody organized, grabs some toilet paper, some wet wipes, and starts mushing down the trail as he's, as he's wiping the, uh, the, the bleeding off of his, his skin. Um, you're just not stopping. You're not stopping um, for yourself. If your, dogs, uh, if your dogs are injured, you absolutely stop. Anja Rodano of Talkeetna fell in a large hole in the ice crossing the infamous Dalzell ice hole. So while she's making her way across the frozen river, her sled slips into the hole. She falls into the, into the water. She injured her ribs and her legs. She's, she's been having a little bit of a struggle along the, the trail, but she said she would not have been able to, to get out of the water hole there without the help of her team, her dog team. Then there's Linwood Fielder. He was on his way to Nikolai, and his entire dog team got separated from the sled when his binder broke. But fortunately for him, there was a fellow musher coming up, Mats P Peterson, who shows up on the trail shortly after. He helped him get his, his whole team, potentially, potentially saved the lives of, of, of lots in, in this. But you've got, you've got trail conditions that are hard this year in, in part of the trail. Um, quite honestly, because of the warmer weather we have seen, uh, they were what we call tussocks, just, just mounds of, of hard matted grass in, in, in just kind of a, uh, a kind of a bumper strip all the way going through that was very, very hard on sleds. Uh, there were a couple mushers that it took 30 hours to go through this one stretch and, and they ultimately decided enough um, and, uh, and scratched. But you have the terrain, but you also have the, the fact that you're, you're, you're going you're going all out for days on end, and the limited sleep has its, its, its effect. And uh, you know, we, we heard some comments from Lance Mackey, who's a four-time Iditarod champ. He was, he was talking about how he's imagining things on the trail, a little bit of a hallucination, seeing and hearing things that aren't there, thinking that he's hearing people say, go Lance, as he's making the run between Roan and Nikolai. And so, You've got to do all that you can to keep yourself awake as you're on the back of the sled. Remember, you're not sitting down. This is not a comfy, cozy ride for 1,100 miles. You're standing on the back of the sled. Oftentimes, you are, you are running along or walking along behind. You're helping your dogs move through. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to constantly replenish yourself and your dogs. So that, means, that means taking trail snacks and, and drinking nonstop. So there's always a question about what everybody eats. Allie Zirkel who uh, has come in fourth. She uh, attributes her, her, her diet to rolled oat bars made out of peanut butter, banana, sesame seeds, and other things because she says they're easy and they don't get frozen. So you gotta think about things like, how do I eat while I'm still moving and, uh, and, and things don't get frozen. They do have an opportunity to get some, some good meals. They get wined and dined, if you will, when they get to a checkpoint where you're in a village, you have the kids come out, everybody's looking for autographs, they want to say hello to them, they want to find out what position everybody's in, but they also oftentimes get, get a warm meal like a stew. But, uh, but before the, the humans eat, before the mushers eat, the dogs have to eat. The dogs have to be cared for. The dogs have to be taken care of first because life on the trail is taking care of the dogs. And so making sure that they've got a warm and a comfortable place to rest, they're fed, they're watered, 
They're checked out by the veterinarians. And this is one thing that's pretty interesting. People think, well, you're just going into a town. A lot of these places, it's not a town. So it's not like you can just go to a tap and, and fill up your, your, your dog bowls for water for your dogs. Now, your dogs have been on the trail for, for several hours. They're thirsty. They've been, they've been eating snow along the way, but they're thirsty. They need to be hydrated. Well, if you're out on the trail and you've got 14 thirsty dogs, what do you do? You melt snow. You melt ice. Where's your stove? Well, you have your little camp stove that you have in the back of your sled. But think about it. You're sleep deprived. You're hungry. You're tired. But you've got to take care of your dogs first. You put the straw down to bed them down. You check their feet. You put dry booties on them. You, you melt the water. You've got to then heat up the dog food that, that has been uh, uh, dropped along the way in, in places where you know your team's going to be stopping. So you can be working with your dogs for a, a good hour before you can even start thinking about yourself and how you satisfy your hunger, your thirst, your, your sleep. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing race. Again, I, I, uh, I, I'm just in awe of, of the animals. I'm in awe of the mushers. I'm also in awe of the many, many, many people who come to, to be volunteers for this race. Most people have no idea what it takes to pull off a race like this, but I'm told that there are more volunteers that help us at this race than any other uh, organized race like this in the country. So what we have is a volunteer air force, if you will. So those stashes of food that I talked about, those, those don't get there by accident. There's no road to drive them by. And so you have, you have pilots who will volunteer to, to take, whether it's straw for bedding or, or, or take uh, 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 big coolers and containers of, of, of food to the various checkpoints. And they'll, they'll drop them off so that they're pre-positioned out there. But those guys, they're all volunteers. At the, at the banquet in, in Nome at the end of this week, the people who put on the banquet are volunteers, not necessarily from Nome, from all over the country. The last time I was up there, I, I went back in the kitchen to say thank you for the, to the men and women who are working there. They all have their little name tags, and they say where they're from. There's a whole group that was from a little town in Florida. They'd all taken a week vacation from their work to come up and just be here for the Iditarod, to welcome the mushers coming in. I said, what's your, what's your what do you do here as, as a volunteer? They said, we are in charge of rolls and butter. OK. But this is how much of a commitment they have made to this race. They've been doing it for years. They're the group that just come up from Florida. They, they cash in their miles. They, they, they take leave from work. And this is where they take their vacation, because they realize that this is such an extraordinary happening. But you've got volunteers from all over the country, from Canada, uh, in the communities, along the trails, the veterinarians. There are 50 veterinarians along the trail. Because at the checkpoints, the dogs must be checked by the vets. We're going to take care of those animals and make sure. So you have veterinarians, you have dog handlers, you have vet techs that come from across the nation. They are there volunteering their time to be at this extraordinary event. Again, the pilots that, that fly to drop the supplies are volunteers. They act as race judges. They aid in the event of an injury or, or a lost dog. The list goes on and on and on in terms of those that volunteer. But ultimately, it simply could not happen were it not for the, the volunteers that put the extra mile in to make it happen. So, so today, we're celebrating and acknowledging the efforts of all those who pitched in to help, the fans who cheered on the teams throughout the race, the communities who served as hosts along the way, and all the mushers and, and all their, their teams who put their heart, they put their soul into this really tough um, but incredible expedition. So we in Alaska are all congratulating Pete Kaiser on, on his win, the only musher from the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta since the inaugural Iditarod back in 1973. He's the first Yupik Iditarod champion in the history of the Iditarod race. 
He is an incredibly humble man. He's a great role model. He's really an inspiration to his community. And uh, I, I know that they are all exceptionally proud. After he won, Pete said that he hoped his victory would be celebrated not just by the Yupik people within his region, but by all Native people throughout uh, Alaska. And so Pete, I think we're here today to tell you um, that today Alaskans in the western part of the state, all over the state, including as far away as Washington, D.C., are all celebrating and recognizing you and your extraordinary uh, canine athletes.